from St. Louis Public Radio. This is Politically Speaking. Congressman Billy Long is hoping that a folksy style and a conservative voting record will appeal to Republican primary voters in a high-stakes U.S. Senate race. But the Springfield Republican will have to stand out in a crowded field that includes a former governor, a fellow member of Congress, and the state's attorney general. On this episode of Politically Speaking, Long joins us to talk about the big issues that he'll encounter during this campaign and why he thinks he can win in August and in November. Let's hit the music. This is the Politically Speaking podcast, the definitive show about Missouri politics. We have to talk about things that matter to people. I've tried to bring that same aggressive iconoclast style with me to uh, the United States Senate. I think my district is a model for the state. We put Missourians first. You just kind of have to find the common ground with people. I believe that this district deserves someone who represents their values. After I came back to St. Louis, I started thinking that I could have a bigger role on the change that I wanted to make. And welcome to Politically Speaking. I'm your host, St. Louis Public Radio political correspondent Jason Rosenbaum. Joining me in Jefferson City, she is St. Louis Public Radio State House and politics reporter. Sarah Kellogg. And joining us as our special guest today, he is a Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate and the congressman for Missouri's 7th Congressional District. Billy Long. And in Washington, they say it's all one word, Billy Long. Billy, Billy Long, thank you so much for, for joining us today. You are one of what I would classify six major Republican candidates in a field of 100,000 other candidates. Um, I think it's really only 21, but why do you think you're the best candidate to lead your party in November in the U.S. Senate race? I think that I'm the one that can win this race in the general without a lot of big pushback from the Democrats. I think that if we elect Eric Greitens, that uh, the party has told us we're going to have to spend 40 to $50 million trying to drag him across the finish line. I've been in Congress. This is my 12th year. I come from a small business background. I was an auctioneer, real estate broker for 31 years before I ever went to Congress. I don't know how many congressmen you know that Congress was the first political position they ever held, and they were 55 years old when they got sworn into Congress. So I come to this from a complete, I know Vicki Hartsworth has been in politics, state elected uh, representative or whatever in her low 30s, same for Schmidt. He was in his low 30s when he got in. So they've been around a long time. And uh, I've signed the front of a check for 31 years and uh, hired people, fired people. And I always thought, Jason, that uh, people with real life experiences needed to go to Congress, not someone that started at mayor and then state rep, state senate. 20 years later, you look up and the local congressman's retiring and their friends say, oh, you'd be great. Well, they've never done anything. They're, they're, they're politicians. So I come to it from a business guy's background. I have by far the most conservative voting record. If you check American Conservative Union, if you check Club for Growth, if you check Freedom Works, Freedom Works, for example, I'm 100% in their most recent score, and Vicki is 60%. There's a lot of difference in 100% and 60% on Club for Growth. 2020, on the most recent rating, again, back on in 2020, was uh, 92% for me, 61% for Vicki, who's tied with Liz Cheney. So when I call Vicki mini Liz Cheney, that's where that stems from. She's tied at Freedom Works with her. She's tied at uh, Club for Growth. An American Conservative Union, 87 for me and 78 for both Vicki and Liz Cheney. So I uh, I was 55 years old when I got sworn in. I don't owe anyone anything. No one owes me anything. This is not life or death for me, Jason. If I, if I win, I'm going to be the best senator I know how to be. I'm going to be the same guy that I've been for the last 12 years. Uh, like Kellyanne Conway, who's my senior advisor, tells people, she said, you send Billy to the Senate, you don't have to worry about it. I mean, you send Eric Schmidt there, you're going to have to worry, is he going to be the Eric Schmidt that's the big conservative that he proclaims to be today? Or is he going to get the Eric Schmidt that they call the ninth Democrat senator when he was in the Missouri Senate that voted change law so that Smithfield Foods could be bought by a Chinese company and along with 40,000 acres of Missouri farmland, which they couldn't do before that vote was taken. He tried to put a Chinese port in uh 
or a hub, excuse me, a Chinese hub in St. Louis area. They're bringing cheap Chinese merchandise. And so are you going to get that guy or are you going to get the guy of the day that tells you, I sued China. I, I'm tough on China. So uh, I'm the, I'm, you know, I'm your uncle, Billy, your cousin, Billy, whatever the guy you can go fishing with on the weekend when I'm home. Yeah. I'm not a, not a politician. And that, you know, it appeals to some people, others it doesn't. So that's why I think that I'd be the best choice to go on over across the hall and work on the Senate side. You've mentioned before that one of your appeals is that you're not being backed by any mega donors or super PACs, but isn't that also a sign that major players within the Republican Party don't see your candidacy as viable as Schmitz or Hartzler's or Greitens's? I've never been popular with the Missouri Republican Party, the National Party. I've always been an outsider. And so it does say that, uh, you know, as from day one, I knew that raising money would be a problem. We, I don't have the billionaire. Schmidt's got three billionaires backing him in St. Louis. Eric Greitens has two billionaires backing him outside uh, of the state. And uh, Dick Uline and Bernie Marcus, the co-founder of Home Depot, and then Dick Uline, who's a huge, he always picks about four Senate candidates every term and puts about 10 million behind each one. He's so far that I know of, he's put two and a half million behind Greitens and Marcus put a million Schmidt's pack at three and a half million. Hartzler, this is an interesting story. Four days after Josh Holly endorsed her. Now, this I've been to Mitch McConnell's office and we were talking about the race. And he said, Well, I, uh, Josh and I have been talking about this race. Well, my antenna popped up and I'm like, Okay, something's up. Sure enough, Holly endorses a couple of three days later. And then Chris Cox and another buddy of his used to be at the National Rifle Association set up this mystery pack out of the ether. Nobody knows where it came from. And just and they endorsed two people that day. They endorsed Katie Britt and Vicki Hartzler. Katie Britt, and, by uh, the yeah. way, is a is an Alabama Republican who actually just won the Republican primary yesterday. We're recording this on June twenty second, but continue, Congressman. And and that's my point is that it's a Mitch McConnell backed group that he's friends with Chris Cox and the other ones. I mean, I know the inner workings and it didn't just pop up out of nowhere. It popped up because Mitch McConnell said, you guys need to set up a pack. We need to get Katie Britt over the finish line. I don't want Mo Brooks on this side of the building. He's too close to Donald J. Trump. And we need to get Vicki Hartzler over the finish line because I don't want Billy Long on this side of the building. He's too close to Donald J. Trump. And they know we vote too conservative to uh, fit into their plan of where they sell out all the time. So uh, that's kind of, as you said, Jason, as we're recording this last night, Katie won in Alabama. So it's one down, one to go. The swamp has their candidate in Alabama, and now they got to get their candidate in Missouri elected. And Vicki has all the swamp behind her, the Missouri swamp, the D.C. swamp, all everyone's coalesced behind her. And what the, really the untold story about this whole race for the Missouri Senate is Vicki with McConnell's pack with all these endorsements from all these different organizations with uh, Governor Bond behind her with Peter Kinder behind her with uh, not yeah I guess it was Governor Bond at one time but Senator Bond Governor Bond whatever you want to call him and uh, uh, Peter Kinder former Lieutenant Governor behind her and all these people are just Vicky 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 all the way and she's probably raised more money than anyone in the race and then you've got Eric Schmidt, who, like I said, he's got Rex Singfield there in St. Louis. He's got August Bush the 4th or 5th or 22nd or whatever it is. And he's got uh, Jeff Fox behind him, all these St. Louis billionaires backing him. He's got Rex is one of the biggest donors to Americans for Prosperity or Americans for China, I call it, because they like to bring in cheap Chinese stuff too. And uh, But they, he's got all these powerful people behind him and they're running all, you saw the door hanger or the mailer that they sent out the other day with the three Supreme Court, Missouri Supreme Court justices with uh, Schmidt there smiling, smiling in the middle, which of course is totally untoward. The Supreme Court came out and said, hey, that should have never happened. Oh, well, we didn't do it. We didn't do it. It wasn't our piece. Yeah, it was American for prosperity. So, you know, denial, denial or plausible deniability or whatever you want to say. So they backed off from that that piece. But my, my point is Schmidt and Hartzler have all the money in the world, all the big, big donors behind them, all these huge people, and they have not been able to break out in this race. They're both stuck down in the polls. They're way behind Greitens in the polls. And so Greitens cuts this ad uh, yeah. earlier this week. 
I, I was just going to ask you about that. You transitioned to it pretty well. Like, what do you think of that ad, where which features Greitens storming into a house with people dressed as soldiers hunting for rhinos? Like, I know that you've been criticizing Schmidt and Hartzler, but I don't think you would argue that they should be, like, rounded up like deer. Like, what do you think about that? Well, I, I'm, I was I was probably the first one to comment on the ad because of Kansas City Star reporter. I was bass fishing down on Table Rock Lake a couple of days ago, the day that the ad came out at 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning, and I get a text from a reporter, and he sent me the ad. First I'd seen of it, of course, so I'm in my bass boat, and I, I look at my phone, I watch the ad, and I immediately said, you know, it's very distasteful. It's uh, dang. I, I didn't tell him it was dangerous, but I, you know, I think that it's extremely distasteful. I think that it's dangerous. And I think that it was done for earned media. And that's exactly why they did the ad. That's exactly, and it, and the Greitens camp got huge earned media out of the spot. I, I, it was a terrible, terrible ad in my opinion, but if you're at Greitens, I guess you do what you want to do. And as long as they got a bunch of millions and millions and millions of dollars earned media, and I've heard people call in on radio shows since then that don't seem to have our list. Oh, it was just in good fun. And it was not in fun. It was not uh, humorous. There was nothing humorous about it. If you want to beat rhinos, you beat them at the ballot box. I mean, to say that you're going to go hunting rhinos is beyond the pale, in my opinion. But like I said, this is politics 2022 style. And all the earned media in the world is great, whether they're saying good things or bad things about you, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Well, let's move on to issues. And I want to talk about the January 6th committee and just the general general discourse about the 2020 election. And I'm going to say something to you that I've said on other shows, especially to Democrats. I, I, I believe Joe Biden won the election. And the reason why I say that is because I've covered other disputed elections before in St. Louis, and they were overturned because election abnormalities would have influenced the outcome. And the Trump campaign has not produced any evidence that would have overturned the elections in enough states to change the electoral votes. But at the Boys State Forum where I moderated, you still seem to think that there's some doubt about whether Biden won the election. Why am I wrong here? I I don't know uh, what I said there that led you to that conclusion, but I went to Biden's inauguration he uh, won the election. How he won is what I have a problem with. And I think how he won was all of this. That's, I don't know if you saw Biden yesterday, but he said there's another another pandemic coming, another pandemic coming. But what he means by that is we need to do all mail-in ballots now. So there were so many irregularities, so many things that were done unconstitutional leading up to the election day. It was putting uh, the Democrats ran around uh, Mark, I uh, can't think of his name right now, Elias, Mark Elias, the big, uh, he's the one in the uh, Al Franken race up there in Minnesota that uh, against Norm Coleman, setting Senator Norm, Norm Coleman. And I think Coleman was up seven or eight hundred dollars, seven or eight hundred votes uh, the night of the election. And Mark Elias swoops in and says, we want to count these ballots, but not those, those, but not these, these over here, we'll count now those we don't want to count. So in the recount, the Republicans sit around fat, dumb, and happy and let him do what he wanted to do. And after eight months, uh, Coleman finally throws in the towel, he's gone from a 700 and some vote advantage to 300 and some vote disadvantage. And so the Democrats have had this game down for a long time. And what they do, they sue, sue, sue. I don't know how many hundred lawsuits they filed this last time, but down in, uh, let's see, was it Georgia? I think it was down in Georgia where they filed the lawsuit. Yeah, and the Secretary of State down there in Georgia said, hey, said, I'm going to settle this thing so we don't get any bad publicity. Well, the way he settled it was he let them put Democrat drop or boxes in Democrat precincts, but not Republican precincts. And uh, there was two or three other things that he did that, you know, that he agreed with the Democrats to drop the lawsuit, which, so all of their irregular, due, due to COVID, they all blamed on COVID. And so I think that's part of Biden's plan this time is saying there's another pandemic coming. I think that if all these state laws in Pennsylvania were changed by judges and by county or, you know, state officials, just like down in 
Georgia, the Secretary of State made the decision. These uh, election laws, as you know, are supposed to be determined by the representatives in those states. The state house is supposed to be the only one that can change election laws. Several states didn't do that. They let courts and elected officials do it on their own. And so if there's question is how he won, if it wouldn't have been for COVID, I think Trump would have won the election. You've criticized the formation of the January 6th committee as a distraction to President Biden's problems. But how can you make the argument the committee can't meet and Congress can deal with other matters at the same time? Well, they, the way that the committee was set up, I mean, the, the only Republicans that we wanted to put on, they booted off. They, pay, they picked two hand-picked Trump-hating Republicans to put on the committee. So I've got a lot of issues with the committee and how it, how it was set up. Uh, we could be, you know, we've got all kinds of problems in this country without having a sham committee like the January 6th committee. And you're, you're referring to the fact that Jim Jordan and Jim Banks were not allowed on the committee. Why not just put two other people that are, you know, strong Republican partisans besides them? Why did you have to take your ball and go home and have Kinziger and Cheney on there instead of two other people? Because Pelosi is not going to tell us what to do. I mean, how, how would you like to have an impartial panel and you say, OK, Democrats pick so many impartial people, we'll pick so many and put them on. And say, oh, no, no, we don't want yours. We want you to go down the chain and pick some others that don't know as much about the issues. It's ludicrous to let them tell you what to do. So that's why uh, we said we're done with this. Thus far, witness after witness, including members of President Trump's political and White House staff, have told the committee they knew Trump lost the election and that his continued litigation of the 2020 results is based on falsehoods. Why shouldn't we take Ivanka Trump, Bill Barr, and Jason Miller's word over Trump's? I, I don't know, you know, at what point they knew that. Uh, there was, you know, weeks and weeks and months after that uh, they kept saying they're going to come up with evidence and everything. So I don't know how Ivanka and Bill Barr and uh, who, whoever, Jason Miller, uh, I don't know at what point in time they came to that conclusion. So after months and months and months, maybe you should take their word for it. Let's move on to the next topic, which is uh, gas prices and inflation. What do you think of the idea to suspend the gas tax as a way to relieve pain at the pump? I, I think it's less than putting a Band-Aid on the problem. It's uh, it, the whole thing behind this gas thing is clear, you know, as the nose on your face. I mean, it's the day that Biden got sworn in, he immediately stopped Keystone XL pipeline. He, und he had such a bad case of Trump derangement syndrome. He undid everything that Donald J. Trump did that was good, including the uh, permits. He says, Biden will say, there's 9,000 leases out there. They could be drilling. No, they can't because you got itchy drilling permits and they want all of his green people uh, new Green Deal folks won't let them issue any drilling permits. So this thing, we were energy independent. I was on, I am on the Energy and Commerce Committee. At one point, I was on the Energy Subcommittee of Energy and Commerce, and we worked long and hard to uh, be able to export LNG, liquefied natural gas. And we finally, after years and years, got that done. Uh, January 20th, 2021, we were a net exporter of oil until noon on that day when uh, President uh, Biden got sworn in. And so it's, it, there's so many things that you could do. I mean, Trump re reduced regulations. He had the oil flowing. He had cheap oil. He filled up our petroleum reserves at whatever it was, $33, you know, just ridiculously low prices on oil because he was smart enough. No, hey, this is bargain basement time. Filled up our reserves. And now uh, Biden decided that $100 a barrel or whatever to dump those reserves out. And uh, so there's just so many things that this Trump derangement syndrome has led to on the oil prices that could be, and oil doesn't trade on today's market. The gas prices don't trade on today's market. They trade on the future. And if Biden would just come out this afternoon and say, hey, I'm going to issue drilling permits. I want to help these oil companies instead of writing them a letter saying, you all need to lower your prices. But I saw a tweet today a guy sent out. He said, I really want to thank President Biden for his proposal because next time I fill up, Instead of being $130, it's only going to be $126 to fill up my car. So it, it's a joke. It's a temporary fix, and I doubt it'll get through the Senate. How, how big does your car have to be to pay $130 for gas, though? You'd have to do the math. I don't know, but I filled mine up the other day, and I stood there and auctioned it off as, as the pump was going up. Hi, I'm a 71 today. What do you do? Do you think you able to buy my 70? See, whole, whole see I, 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 I'm glad I asked I that. To, yeah. When I got up to a hundred dollars, my it was a suburban, so I don't know how big the tank is. But when I and this is way 
this is two months ago, three months ago, before it all really took off where it is now. And it quit at $100. So it's probably easy to fill it up at $130 today. But my yeah. credit card would only hold 100 So I can't tell you how big the car would have to be to put 130 But it's, you know, some consolation. And I would only cost 126 next time. So you mentioned Keystone Pipeline, the Keystone XL Pipeline. I, I was scanning, like the internet to figure out when that would have been completed had Biden not canceled the permit. And one energy publication said 2023. So how does canceling that have any impact over gas prices now when it wouldn't have been finished by now to do much of anything? Well, it would have helped in 2023. I mean, I don't know. You know, and like I said, it trades on the futures if there's word coming that there's going to be more oil and everything the price goes down so i don't know directly how to correspond but now that it's been completely stopped there's no hope canada will sell their oil to china or wherever now instead of us so there's nothing good about stopping it what would you say to the argument that president trump contributed to inflation by passing gigantic covid 19 spending bills in 2020 from looking up the cares act for instance that passed the house through a voice vote yeah, well, there was uh, during COVID, there were some bills that, you know, came through that on the front end, when people were freaked out, panicked, told to stay home, couldn't, you know, had to wash their groceries before they brought them in the house. And uh, it, it was a very dangerous time in this country. Everything could have gone down very quickly. And so there was a lot of that spending that uh, was done. And a lot of it was unaccounted for, which was bad, that uh, should have had some accounting done more than what was. But I think a lot of folks voted for the first COVID packages uh, because there was immediate relief needed. I think the very first one I didn't vote for because there was no help to individuals. The second one I think I voted for because there was help to individuals coming out of that. We'll be right back after this quick break with Congressman Billy Long. And we're back on Politically Speaking with Congressman Billy Long. He is the congressman for the 7th Congressional District in Southwest Missouri and one of six major Republican candidates for the U.S. Senate. I want to move on to guns. As we're recording this, we're about 12 or 14 hours removed from the Senate taking a procedural vote to pass this multifaceted bill around guns. And it does a lot of things, like it provides funding for states that have so-called red flag laws that would try to get guns out of the hands of people that are dangerous to themselves or others. And it also provides a lot of money for mental health research. So you're going to be voting on this if it passes the Senate. What are kind of your impressions of this? And would you be a yes or a no on this bill at this point? I haven't read the bill. It's 80 pages, so it won't take too awful long to read it. But from what I know about it, I will definitely be a no on the bill or Second Amendment rights. People in Missouri are very, very concerned about losing their Second Amendment rights. And uh, as far as these red flag laws, Missouri doesn't have them. Uh, A lot of states uh, do have, I think 19 states do have them. And I don't know exactly what the wording is in there on these red flag laws, how it would affect a state like Missouri that doesn't have them, if it's just just to help the ones that do, do have these red flag laws. But my biggest problem with red flag laws is I always see the face of one of my colleagues that went through just a horrendous divorce abusive situation several years ago. And any time red flag laws are brought up, she points out, she says that she she claims, and I imagine it's the truth, she said that, uh, you know, they could have taken her gun away from her at that point, which was the only thing that kept her uh, from, you know, meeting her demise in her words. So uh, you got to be careful when you go, you say, all right, this guy needs to have his guns taken. That guy doesn't. And so with that, now, as far as the background checks on your uh, juvenile record, I don't, but I mean, why didn't they put this in pieces where we could vote for some of it and pass some of it instead of putting in a, uh, you know, a third rail for most people in Missouri of these red flag laws, if they, they could have put in the uh, it, 18 years old, you're going to buy a gun you know, on your 18th birthday, you're one day old at that point, according to them, because they can't look back and see if you were abusing animals or things that a lot of these folks that start out with problems start out with. Uh, On that issue of red flag laws, like as you kind of mentioned, this doesn't require states like Missouri to have red flag laws. It basically just gives money to states that already have them, 
Like, why would that be an infringement on Second Amendment rights if it's just financially supporting things that are already in place in other states? It, it just goes back to the same thing of, you know, as soon as this, these incidents happen, Biden comes out one day and says, well, they need to take this gun away. They, then he starts talking about nine millimeter handguns, really. And uh, so it just starts a cascade. And, and the voters in Missouri, I represent 751,000 people. And the calls that I get to my office are far, 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 far outweigh wanting to address any type of a red flag law. What do you make of proposals to ban AR-15s or raise the age when people can buy guns? It's, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, how are you going to have people serving in the military at 18 years old and tell them they can't go out and buy, buy a gun as far as the age limit things? And ARs, uh, they were banned at one point, and they, you know, the statistics didn't go down whenever they were banned. So people use them for sporting, for hunting, whatever they can use them for. The, if you remember the Virginia Tech, shooter i think that was done i believe i don't know if it was a handgun or whether it was but it was a very low magazine because they say well you need to increase the or decrease the magazine size well this guy killed a heck of a lot of people with several magazines that he you know put in so uh it's just not something that the average missouri voter in the seventh district of missouri would want me to support I want to move on to the topic of Ukraine. Why did you vote against giving Ukraine 40 billion in military and humanitarian aid? I, again, it goes back to what the constituents in my area, the calls we get, the thing they they see us, you know, trying to be policemen of the world, fighting these wars around the world where Trump kept us out of war when he was in there. And whenever Putin went into Crimea the first time around, guess what? Obama was president. Putin didn't go anywhere whenever Trump was in because he knew that he would strike back. He took the measure of Biden for about a year and then he decided he was free to, to line up troops. If we were going to do something, why didn't we do something when they were lining these tanks up and everything before it started? Our intelligence on that was superb. It was like Putin had a GoPro on him. I mean, it was like we were in the meetings, the intelligence readouts that we got on that before it happened, and they knew exactly what Putin was going to do. So uh, this we've got tremendous, tremendous drug problems in this country coming over our southern border. We've got... Uh, the wall was another thing that Biden did because of his hatred for Trump. He stopped building the wall. It's laying on the ground down there. I went down there in April of 21 after Trump was out of office with President Trump and with Greg Abbott, governor down there, and stood there in front of where the wall stopped and where it was laying in pieces on the other side because Biden had decided not to build it. There were people streaming over with Biden Harris t-shirts on, if you remember, there's hundreds and hundreds of people coming across. Did, did that actually happen? People were streaming over the border with Biden Harris t-shirts? Yeah, you didn't see the pictures of No, them? no, I, I didn't, but like yeah. maybe they just got that because they needed clothes or something. Why would that signal that they're supporters of the president or something like that? Well, the the indication at the time was that he had said you can come in. And so that was why they uh why they did that. Can't you work on domestic issues at the same time as providing aid to Ukraine? Well, when you have so many domestic, how far would $40 billion have gone in this country to fortify our schools, to, to protect our school children, to, to finish the wall? $40 billion would have gone a long, long ways in this country for all these problems that we have. We've got the baby formula shortage that Biden didn't even address for four months. And I guarantee if Trump was still president, he would have had the problem solved within that four months instead of waiting four months to go look at why they closed, sending his people in to figure out why the lab was closed. Well, they knew why it was closed, but what it would take to reopen it. So again, the calls that we get to my office, the emails we get, people are fed up. They're, we've got enough issues in our country that we need to address and 40 billion would have gone a long ways. And my first question was, when are they gonna be back for more well, the other day they came back for another $1.5 billion. So uh, it's a never ending situation. So that's that's my take on it. By the way, to fact check myself, I did just do a Google search. And according to Business Insider, there was a group of migrants that were wearing Biden, please let us in T-shirts in 2021 to, I guess, protest the fact that they couldn't get into the country. So that was that did actually happen. I do want to make that clear before we move on to our next topic, which is Roe versus Wade. 
We are recording this again on June 22nd. The Supreme Court has not ruled on the Dobbs case yet. But by the time this podcast is posted, it, it's likely that the Supreme Court will have made a decision about whether Roe versus Wade stands or is overturned. And as I'm sure you know, if the court overturns Roe, Missouri will ban abortions except for medical emergencies with no exceptions for rape or incest. Why do you think this would be a good public policy for the state for this trigger law to go into effect? Well, I graduated high school in 1973. In 1973 is when Roe v. Wade came down, and uh, I didn't understand the concept of taking a human life uh, that that could possibly be okay in a civilized society then. I still don't understand it today. And one thing about this Roe v. Wade leak that came out of the Supreme Court, and that's what's different about me and a lot of my opponents, is that... uh, Chris Hayes on MSNBC tried to make fun of me one day, and he put two or three pictures of me up there and said, this is kind of far right wing Congressman Billy Long, which I've never been a far called a far right wing Congressman before. But uh, he said last night when the leak came out, we wanted to see what Republicans were saying. And this is the only one that that came out and said that he hoped that the leak was true, that they were going to overturn Roe v. Wade. And he said, why wouldn't he say that? That to end the uh, practice of abortion. Why wouldn't he say that? That's what he's been working on for 50 years. That's what his colleagues have been working on for 50 years. But the leadership, Republican leadership, sent out a memo to tell everyone, don't talk about abortion, talk about the leak. Don't talk about abortion, talk about the leak. And I was, he said, we couldn't find anybody but Billy Long that actually talked about abortion. And, and then it showed Mitch McConnell parroting the words of, you know, the leak, the leak, the leak. And it showed Ted Cruz talking about the leak, the leak, the leak, not abortion. And uh, Lindsey Graham talking about the leak, the leak, the leak. But that's what I found in this race is that if you wanted something from me, I'll, I'll you know, I'll give it to you. If uh, Politico did an article about Rick Scott, they, he put out his 11 point plan because they asked Mitch McConnell, they said, what so uh, when you take back or if you take back the Senate, what's your plan? And McConnell looked at him and said, I'll tell you that when we take back the Senate. And Rick Scott said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We need a plan. He came out with an 11 point plan in his 11 point plan. He said, there's a lot of people that aren't paying taxes and everyone needs skin in the game. We need to raise taxes, have a tax for people that aren't paying taxes. They called 27 United States Senate candidates across the United States, 27. And guess how many would answer the question? one and that was me and i and my comment was i mean because rick scott he said of nrsc if you're going to run you need to be nice to rick scott and all that but to me like i said i don't care if school keeps or not i'm going to tell you tell you like it is tell you how to cow eat the cabbage and i said and number one it's ill-advised raising taxes number two everyone is paying taxes every time they go buy something look at the sales tax meter running and number three i've got news and again this was probably three four months ago before inflation got as bad as it is but i said i got news for rick scott and that is that if he wants to raise taxes joe biden beat him to the punch because inflation is the highest tax raise you could ever have and so again you know when things come up and other people won't comment we had the Missouri uh lincoln day statewide lincoln day we had the forum there i don't know if you were there jason i can't remember but I, I, was... I i wasn't but obviously i was the moderator at missouri boys state where you actually mentioned that if roe v wade is overturned it doesn't ban abortion everywhere it just sends it back to the states which is true but a lot of like your republican colleagues have said that they want a national abortion ban and they want to ban abortion everywhere like like what do you think about that i don't think it's a state's rights issue so you would not support that in the Senate if you were if you were elected. I don't. I mean, I don't know how you would do. I don't know how you could how you could make it constitutional when you know it's a states' rights issue. What would you say to people who argue that not allowing abortions for rape or incest victims is way too extreme, even if you think abortion is wrong? Uh, any every life is precious, and every life everyone deserves a chance at life. And, and how do you think this issue will affect the election? Could it motivate supporters of abortion rights to come out of the polls, maybe in, in a greater wave than the people who are against abortion rights? I, I think that, you know, as far as tipping the scale on the election, I, I think that abortion is down the scale in people's minds as far as what drives them to the polls. I think that when they pull up to the gas pump and 
get furious when they went into the gro go into the grocery store and buy what used to cost thirty dollars. Now they're paying fifty one dollars for the same amount. I think those are the things that are driving people to the polls. Uh, the uh, I don't think abortion is it's, abortion's never been a big vote getter as far as I've been able to ascertain. That's all the time that we have for today. Thank you so much, Congressman, for talking with us. Politically Speaking is a product of St. Louis Public Radio, which is part of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. You can follow me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. You can follow Sarah on Twitter at... Sarah K. Kellogg. Okay, so obviously we want people to follow your Twitter because it's very popular and very infamous, for depending on your perspective. But we also want to give you the opportunity to talk about where people can find out more about your campaign outside of social media. Well, my Twitter is an abbreviation of auctioneer, because like I said, I came here as a businessman. I didn't come up with some political Twitter handle. I just used the one I used to use for my auctions, and it's A-U-C-T-N-R-1, uh, A-U-C-T-N-R-1, abbreviation of auctioneer. And the website for the campaign is billylong.com, billylong.com. And uh, if they want to volunteer for the campaign, we're getting ready to put out our four by eight signs and things around the state. If they want to have sign locations for us, we can stick signs up or whatever. If they want to just volunteer to help us knock doors. It's 417-88-FED-UP, 417-88-FED-UP, because I'm fed up and I'm not having it. I just want to tell people, don't vote wrong, vote long, and don't be silly, vote for Billy. Until next time, so long.